before I leave you on the stage, I would like to tell you something, because when I was editor-in-chief of Business Insider a few years ago, uh, I made an interview with Gert Leonard, one of the most influential futurists in the world. Uh, and I guess Wired Magazine also interviewed uh, Gert Leonard. And I asked him, there is no doubt that technological progress will change the world a lot in the next 20 years. The question is, what will it destroy along the way? And Gert answered, People usually think of changes in civilization in terms of some kind of loss. And I believe that 95% of these are positive changes. And I'm curious if you agree. You have to be an optimist in the world of tech. Exactly. <laughs> so the stage is yours. Thank you. So I'm in an unusual position. I came from editing a tech magazine and I got to know the startup founders and became a bit too close to them and started giving them small amounts of money for their flawed businesses, probably not to work. And I've kind of done it so much now. I've ended up with about 80 early stage investments. And I'm going to give you an insight from the way the startups are thinking and from the way the venture capitalists are deploying funds, because it's very relevant to where food and ag are going. Um, for me personally, it means my heartbeat is kind of dangerously irregular. Last night, as I took the taxi from the airport, I had a message that one of the companies I'd backed about three years ago went bankrupt. And so I think, Jesus, I know nothing about what I'm doing. And then when Peter was talking before, I got another message saying another company I'd backed had just sold to a big blue chip company for a multiple. and. The reason it's like this is because there are millions of experiments happening among the startups to try and build the future. Not just the future that technology allows, but the future that the customer wants. And many of those won't make it, typically 90%. But I think what's interesting is how quickly the rest can scale. So I'm going to talk about how quickly things are changing in the world of technology, um, and not simply about food and agriculture. This is one of the crazy things that keeps blowing my mind. This is one of Elon Musk's projects. Can you read the signals in the brain and connect it directly to the network? This monkey has a probe reading the electrical signals on the brain, so the monkey is playing Pong. And this makes you realize that the era of typing, the era of keyboards and a mouse, is soon going to be overtaken by the era of the brain-computer interface. It's not science fiction. It's already being used now in medical contexts. This is a study at the University of San Francisco with a man who can't move his arms or legs or speak, but his thoughts are leading directly to text on the screen. Um, the study was partly funded by Facebook, so goodness knows what will happen if it goes down for five or six hours. Um, artificial intelligence is moving so quickly that stuff that we just imagined as science fiction is now just a commodity. The way that you and I can use computer vision, can simulate things that are not there, is now an everyday occurrence. I'm going to show you somebody who is not Tom Cruise. I'm going to show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. It's not Tom Cruise because this is a deep fake. <laughs> this is somebody, an ordinary user of TikTok, who wanted to show how easy it is to take video feeds of the real Tom Cruise, superimpose it on himself, and create a simulated version of reality. And this is not something now you need NASA, you need a huge lab to do, anybody can do this. If you want to see where the future's going, for instance, look inside games. If you go inside games like Fortnite, there are new kinds of value systems being created, new currencies in the game, new transactions for virtual goods. But there's also now, because the game is a compelling, immersive world, Concerts that people pay to get tickets to. This DJ concert had about 11 million people in the game. So we're now at the world where we can simulate a reality so well that it's replacing going out to the auditorium. 
And then because everybody on the network is connected, sometimes amazing things happen with no organization giving it permission. So you may have seen that there has been a boom in art that's linked to the blockchain. So it's a JPEG, a GIF, it could be copied a million times, but artists are selling an individual version that on the blockchain links it to your ownership. And it's selling for $70 million. It's because there is a decentralized network with nobody giving permission that is allowing people to build new industries. And at some stage soon, there will be the decentralized social network with no Mark Zuckerberg, the decentralized bank with nobody making decisions because the network can interact directly and it's happening now. And then think about what's happening in automation. You've probably seen these videos on YouTube from Boston Dynamics showing how effectively the robot can learn using sensors, using computer vision to adapt, to play parkour, for instance. Um, I don't think they actually make any money, Boston Dynamics, because all they seem to do is put videos on YouTube and then get bought and sold by tech companies like Google and Hyundai. Um, but it reminds me, and I think I see quite a lot, I go to a lot of the technical universities, I talk to a lot of the investors, that I have to change my expectations because the speed at which things are moving. And for this talk, I invented a completely fake algorithm and I ran my talk through it and it told me that this next half hour is going to be 86% exciting and 14% terrifying. So just bear with me for a second. And I'm going to talk about not just the speed of change, but the suddenness of change, which means you can't really ignore things that are at the edge because they're coming mainstream. So the idea of going for a cycle last March became this. The idea of going to church became this. Your church has a digital streaming strategy. It could have done this years earlier, but suddenly there was a need. Your dentist has a digital strategy. What is work now? Where do you go for work? The rules have changed. And very, very strange things have happened in the last year. Things that involve exponential curves. In tech, you get really used to these exponential curves because they start out quite steadily and then whoosh, they take over. This orange curve is the amount of cryptocurrency in circulation. And the blue line is the number of dollars, US dollars in circulation. And earlier this year, the amount of cryptocurrency overtook US fiat dollars. And that says something, that says, here you can ignore it, here you can ignore it, there it's the new rules. And everywhere you go, there are new rules. Things that seemed scientifically unlikely to happen for decades are happening. And I don't know if this is how we'll come to a meeting soon. This is Oculus and its vision of how we'll interact. But you take augmented reality and virtual reality and what's being called the metaverse, the ability to simulate worlds that are very realistic, and you know the rules are changing. <laughs> so what's happening on the farm? What's happening in ag tech? Well, an awful lot, and it's happening that quickly. There are whole new sectors. <laughs> Eat Just, the company behind these chicken nugget style dishes, is based out of San Francisco and got their start in 2011 developing plant-based egg substitutes like mung bean scrambled eggs and mayonnaise. But it wasn't until 2017 that they announced they were shifting focus to a cultured meat product. So, a cultured In order to feed the world that we live in, um, a lot of animal what protein, about coffee without we coffee beans? Here's one of a bunch of startups that's doing just that. So why do we need a coffee that's not made from a bean? Like, it, it right. seems like a problem that doesn't necessarily need a solution. It, many people don't understand the problem that coffee is facing around the world. And the problem is, is that climate change and global warming is really affecting the coffee growing regions. So, there's so a coffee lot of can be grown in a very narrow band. climate change happening and, and thinking, that band well, is you're really not going to be able to, to grow things the in the same way. The Let's use emerging science to create an alternative. Even in Finland, they've been making coffee in a lab. 
We started with a plant-based cell culture. We nurtured the cells, built optimized growing conditions for them, fed them and fermented them over and over again until we found just the right aromas and color. With the coffee cells perfected, it was time to fire up the roasting machines. Finally, we were ready to unveil our groundbreaking brew and take a sip of science. Probably the first cup of coffee ever grown in Finland. There is a surprisingly full aroma. Yeah. So not just in the lab, but in the consumer mind, things are changing. So there are startups like this one called Olio that helps you give your food waste to your neighbors. And look how quickly it's grown. Already 27,000 times it's been used. Five million people using it. Crazy idea five years ago. Why would I want to go to a neighbor with my steak that I haven't used? And the startups are attracting more money than ever. So this is the funding curve that's been growing and growing for agricultural technology. You can't really ignore where the money goes. So my background is I set up a technology magazine in the UK which tries to understand the future by talking not just to the entrepreneurs and the scientists, but the designers, the people who build buildings. And then I got a bit obsessed with the speed of innovation in the startups and the slowness of real innovation in a lot of the big successful organizations. And so I wrote a book, um, which has a slightly rude word in it, that tried to go to these big organizations in about 20 countries and see how the really effective ones were transforming themselves because they saw how quickly things would change. Because so often innovation is theater. It's going through the motions, it's ticking the box. Rather than transforming the organization because technology is enabling you to, and it's certainly enabling your competition to. And innovation is really about using this emerging tech to create future-facing business models. It's not magic. And too often, existing organizations keep going quarter by quarter, even as the ground beneath them has fallen away. I often think about that cartoon with the roadrunner chasing by the equator to the and it still runs for a bit. But gravity keeps taking over. And then innovation is not gimmicks. It's not tech for its own sake. Some of the best venture capitalists in the world lost $120 million on this company. It was meant to be the world's best juice maker. It's a company that built an $800 juicing machine, which had Bluetooth and internet connectivity and sensors. And then you had to buy these very expensive juice sachets. The company, Juicero, was very bullish about how it was going to change consumer behavior. And then some journalists from the Wall Street Journal took some of the juice sachets, they squeezed them in their hands and found they got juice quicker than through the juicing machine. And actually it tasted just as good. So the company very quickly went bankrupt, having lost $120 million. So what can I share that I'm seeing among the climate tech startups the investors, the entrepreneurs coming out of the universities that are trying to reshape food and drink. Um, so it comes down to six trends that begin with C. And I'll kind of run through them briefly and then explain what I mean. Um, and the first one, it kind of starts out as climate change, but take the second word and turn it into climate capital. Turn it into climate creativity because this year alone, for the first half of the year, $17, million, billion, $17 billion has been invested in climate tech companies. Okay? This year alone, private equity companies like TPG have raised $5.4 billion to deploy in climate tech businesses. General Atlantic have raised $4 billion to deploy. So this is a huge business opportunity. At the same time, consumer behavior is demanding new kinds of food and drink, and cell science in the lab is enabling entrepreneurs to create food and drink 
in non-traditional ways. There's also a couple of Cs that are really interesting for the economy. There is a growing market in carbon credits, which is providing a new income stream to companies that can do something to take carbon out of the system. Maybe you plant a forest. Maybe you make biochar. And you get 30, 40, maybe 50 euros per tonne of carbon you can take out of the system. This is new. It's transformative. Competitors, well, I'll talk a bit about some of the new companies competing against the traditional agricultural and food companies because the competition is everywhere now. And finally, the startups have this, but I think all of us need to have it, an expectation that things are going to change very quickly. So what do I mean? So don't think about climate change as much as climate opportunity. So, you know, I don't need to tell you the context. We have all been Westwood winds have blown news. new life is, into these you know, fires. Greece, this is Central Europe. This is everywhere else in the future. And it means that lots of entrepreneurs who have made it in another business, who have had their exit, feel really motivated to do something to solve this problem. And I'm seeing extraordinary creative approaches by multidisciplinary teams coming together to do everything from detailed carbon accounting to build new forms of energy storage. Um, I created a community of about 300 people working in climate tech. Two different teams are working on nuclear fusion. Now, science says nuclear fusion should probably not happen, but these teams as startups are building something that may take a couple of billion euros just to get the first site. There are people making new kind of food and drinks, and these are entrepreneurs who don't mind experimenting in real time. So don't underestimate the determination of the agile, fast-moving teams of entrepreneurs. So the second thing I think we can't ignore is how quickly the norm for consumers changes. So there was a 16-year-old girl in Stockholm who decided not to go to school on Friday. And somehow that becomes a global movement. And somehow she, even before lockdowns, was responsible for fewer people flying from the airports in Sweden. She actually helped popularize a, a Swedish word which means flight shame. So this is a new idea. No longer do you boast that you're on airplanes going to a meeting. Now it's something shameful. And the cultural change is happening really quickly in food. And if you go to Google to book a flight, you may notice that suddenly, as well as the price, as well as the number of stops, you are told how good this is in terms of carbon emissions. So you can choose a flight there. That's because of consumer demand. And there's new startups trying to create the default labeling system for food. Who knows? There's new pressure for non-meat to be mainstream everywhere. There's also a new idea that we should stop expecting retail food to be perfect. So very well-funded companies now that specialize in imperfect food. The British supermarket chain Morrison's even has a section on their website dedicated to what it calls wobbly vegetables. Wobbly means it kind of wobbles, doesn't sand straight. And just think about what's been happening in the dairy market with companies like this. This is oat milk. It's one of dozens of non-dairy milks to enter the dairy alternative scene over the last 20 years. It seems like these days, if it grows from the ground, someone will try to milk it. So Oatly, a billion dollar company out of nowhere. Cell science is when things get really interesting because you can make things that don't necessarily involve an actual animal and we're getting closer to the price point coming down and the taste being good enough that consumers accept it. So I talked a bit about chicken that's not made with chickens, that's made with cell cultures. Um, the same is happening with fish. This is a startup called Finless Foods. The same is happening to salmon. It's hard to make fish that you can cook because I think a lot of the fats 
are destroyed. But we're already getting experimentation from startup companies are working on cellular seafood, and of those, only a few have held public tastings. Back in June, San Francisco-based company WildType held a tasting of its cellular salmon, including poke, ceviche, and sushi rolls. And then there are new startups getting quite a lot of funding just to take a tiny bit of the value chain. If you're making a plant-based burger, if it doesn't have the right mix of fats, it's not going to taste like a meat burger. So here's a company in London that's just focusing on the fats. And the this is our food lab where we use robotic equipment to work out the way to make the juiciest fat cells that we can. Here, they think fat, which they create by combining cell biology and mathematical modeling, is magic. So, so this company is called Hoxton Farms using cell biology and mathematical, mathematical mad modeling. It's essentially using AI and computational science to create new forms of food. So the other thing that's happening in the lab is some really motivated founders are trying to understand when the world heats up and we can't grow a lot of today's crops, how we can use gene science to create alternatives. Um, so I've personally got involved in helping um, one such company that's come from um, IndieBio, which is an accelerator, and they're called Avalo, and they are creating a database of which plant products will grow in which changing climate. For a decade, scientists have been hunting for the genes for cold tolerance. Until we came along, they'd only found three. This March, Avalo turned on its AI. We discovered 32. So it's using this AI is polar and the knowledge growing in of genetics to create new blends of drought-resistant rice or all sorts of other crops. Who knows how one of those could become the next staple food? And then the founders of these startups are also trying to solve some of the other problems. There's a bunch of companies, Volta Foods in Scandinavia, I think, um, trying to find a new way to feed animals so that they don't produce such a large amount of methane, sometimes using algae, because methane is a bit worse than CO2. Scientists are feeding cows seaweed in an attempt to reduce the amount of methane they produce. How much methane actually comes from cows? About 25% of methane are produced directly uh, from fermentation uh, by the cows. Okay, so that's burping and farting together. Both. Both. But That's a business opportunity. So, a million approaches using microbes that help plants grow. There's a whole bunch of approaches um, using genomics to help plants grow, using cloud biology. A lot of these companies you're not going to hear about, but some of them are going to change the rules. So I mentioned carbon markets. So there's really interesting experiments happening with if you rethink the economics of a forest by planting different types of trees that sink more carbon in the ground. First of all, the owner of that forest can sell those credits because you're making the land more carbon negative. And you can also use that knowledge to grow crops more quickly. Um, there's one company I'm just getting involved with that focuses entirely on the fungus below the trees. The roots of the trees connect to each other with a whole layer of fungus and they send signals to each other. They tell, it's like a little social network in the soil. They tell other trees when there's a drought threat, when there's more light available over here. And it turns out that if you can customize the fungus for the local soil microbiome, you can make those plants grow more drought resistant, more disease resilient, faster, and able to sink more carbon in the ground. So everywhere I look, a creative approach. This is another company in the community I work at, trying to help farmers work out how to optimize the use of each individual field for 
carbon sinking, but also changing the behavior and using all sorts of data points from satellite imaging and everything else. So what did I mean about competitors? I meant that everybody here who's involved in traditional agriculture, I think has to assume that there are founders from completely unrelated fields who are trying to build something that competes. So I've spent some time lately with the founder of a company that makes cheese with no dairy. With a company that makes milk, yogurt, using biotechnology to turn nutrients into the equivalent of milk proteins. Um, there's another one, Better Dairy. There's a whole bunch of these companies. In fact, in the meat field alone, these are some of the startups. Some of them working on plant-based meat, cell-based meat. Some of them working on pork and poultry. And there's an awful lot of money going into making these companies produce some revenue because they produce what the customers want. So everywhere tech is affecting agriculture, from how you manage the farms, from getting data from the animals, from new smart irrigation, from sensors, from drones and robotics. And everywhere you look, there's risk, but potential transformation. You know, what's happening in automation in the farm? The great thing about startups is I can't tell you which ones are going to win, but you know collectively some of them are going to win. There's a, another company called Tortuga that makes these little robots that pick fruit. Maybe they'll run out of money before they make enough to pay the debts, or maybe they'll be the way that all of us expect our fruits to be picked. So, geofencing for your cattle, there's a startup for that. And I don't need to tell you about the number of vertical farms that have raised quite a lot of money. They've raised the money because the investors see actually quite big markets of customers ready to pay. With massive innovation in lighting technology over the last few years, vertical farms have all of a sudden gone from science projects to legitimate businesses capable of feeding lots of people. But as lighting costs go down and the technology improves, it's actually the future of these farms that I'm so interested in. Some people are turned off by the pristine mechanical growing conditions, like it's something out of the matrix, but that's actually what makes it so exciting. Companies like Bowery Farming have the opportunity to re-engineer every aspect of the growing process. Even so. Everywhere you look, there's a bunch of these companies and some of them are going to make it and some of them are not, but they're going to change customer expectations. And they're starting to appear in the middle of cities. I walked past one in the center of London yesterday by Old Street Roundabout from a company called Infarm. Freight Farms provides new farmers with training and, crucially, the basic outline of a business plan to get them going. I was looking at people's discussions about growing in cities, particularly one by the Conservation Law Foundation, which analyzed how much you could grow in, in the existing space that was available in cities. It struck me that it really wasn't very much. So, get ready for a growth of robots on the farm. It's almost comparable to Autonomous when the tractor robots overtook the horse. driving the tractor for you. Completely changed how we. This is the old way of harvesting lettuce. It's tedious and unbelievably backbreaking. And this is the new way. Meet the automatic lettuce harvester. Hear that? That's the sound of water knives, ultra high pressure blasts that cut through the plant, which is then escorted up to workers who trim and sort it. And what if you can get data that you never got before to help improve the crops? This is the world's smallest hyperspectral camera that we have developed. Uh, and the special thing about it is that we can collect and analyze light across a very large number of spectral components. And from this data, we can derive detailed information about chemical and biological composition of the surface that we are looking at. So imagery and satellite data becomes really important. A way to use light to see what the soil constituents are. A way to use electricity to get rid of weeds instead of fertilizers. 
everywhere you look, there's craziness. I even met a company that was making fine wine without using grapes. This is the company, it's called Endless West, and they were using molecular science to replicate the molecular smell, taste, footprint of wine. Don't tell French people this, they get very upset, but they have a whiskey on the market at the moment called Glyph, and it's pretty good, but it's not made the traditional way. And finally, the last of my C's is, I think, the way that we all need to think about change as a constant, as the norm. Because things move quickly. In 1956, this was how five megs of storage was uploaded to an aeroplane. And yet, because of those exponential curves, stuff that was expensive becomes ubiquitous and free. So what do you do if you're not prepared for that change? I'll give you one example um, that I tracked for my book, and it is a food-related business, but actually the frying pan business. This is Stanley Cheng, who became a billionaire making frying pans that you probably have in your home. It's the second biggest manufacturer of saucepans and frying pans in the world. It's called Mayer. And his son, Vincent, who's in his 30s, says, Dad, you know, the internet's coming for the frying pan for the kitchen, what do we do? And Stanley, the billionaire, said, I don't really understand. And Vincent says, you know, connected cooking, Dad. The oven downloads recipes and cooks alongside you. The dad, to his credit, said, look, I don't get this, I don't understand it, but here's some money. Do a startup inside the company experiment. So Vincent takes a converted barn in the wine country in Silicon Valley, hires a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs, gets them to make recipes that they film and put in an app that connects via Bluetooth to a connected saucepan that they've developed, which has a temperature sensor embedded in the metal, so it controls how hot the saucepan is alongside the chefs. And the idea is you can cook as well as the Michelin-starred chef and you'll download recipes, you'll subscribe like Netflix, you'll maybe get 50 recipes a month. It's a crazy idea for a saucepan company. But I said to Stanley, how big is this gonna be? And he said, well, look, it's either gonna be a billion dollar business or zero, but if we don't play, and our competitors do, we're gonna be zero. So this change mindset, let me give you some examples of when people who should have known better didn't have that mindset. The early part of this century, a company called Skype was rising. The head of a big telco called AT&T mocked them in public, said what Skype is doing is like a toy. They'll never get anywhere. Well, it wasn't the right, the right answer. Um, when Netflix started rising at the beginning of the 2010s, a big incumbent Time Warner, a big media company. The head mocked them, said it's a bit like, is the Albanian army gonna take over the world? <laughs> I don't think so. Netflix's share price rose 2,400% between 2010 and 2018. And I'm gonna leave you with this thing, that when it came out, the head of a big company that was making smartphones called Microsoft went on television and laughed at it. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? Um, so I will leave you with, I know you're all feeling this future sounds a bit horrible and inconvenient, and I want to avoid it. Go with it. Try and use your own unfair advantage to adopt some of these technologies. The first time you encounter a new technology, it can be quite scary. Um, a guy called Bill Rimmer put his mother in his Tesla, set it to autonomous mode. It's scary. Oh, there's cars coming. Oh, oh, there's cars. Oh, Bill, just put me back for me control it. Oh, dear Jesus. I could never. Ah! And you know that in a couple oh, of weeks, going? when she's done it a few times, God it's just going to be a really convenient way to go oh and play God. cards with her what friends. Thank you for listening.